Uh, and also good afternoon for those that are joining uh, both in Kiev, but on both sides of the Atlantic. I know people are still filtering in uh, to the virtual uh, through the virtual door, but we just wanted to welcome everybody on behalf of the German Marshall Fund of the United States, the reanimation package of reforms in Kiev, um, and the Transatlantic Task Force on Ukraine. Uh, we want to welcome you to today's conversation, which is focused on building a, a stronger U.S.-Ukraine strategic partnership. Um, I want to welcome our panelists uh, and our colleagues uh, that helped pull this event together, both in Kiev and Washington, including my colleague, John Alexander. My name is Jonathan Katz. I am a Director of Democracy Initiatives uh, for the German Marshall Fund uh, in Washington, D.C., also Director of the Transatlantic Democracy Working Group. Um, and I, I think just sort of picking up on where we are today, um, there was a long anticipated meeting between, as we all know, between a uh, recent meeting between President Biden and President Zelensky. That was uh, three weeks ago, which is hard to believe because so much has happened uh, in between uh, that meeting and where we are today. Just remind you how quickly uh, time moves. And that's going to be the jumping point, uh, you know, jumping off point for today's conversation. Um, as many of you know, there was tremendous interest and a lot written prior to the biden Zelensky meeting, analysis after we're, afterwards talking about atmosphere, outcomes, concerns. Um, and so here we are in the aftermath. And what we want to do is think through about the agreements that were reached, what comes next. So we're really looking forward to hearing from Ukrainian experts. Today, uh, we're focused on the view from Kiev um, our next TTFU conversation will be looking at American experts looking out um, at what took place and what will take place next. And what we saw was obviously outcomes and commitments that came out of um, an effort to revitalize the strategic relations between the United States and Ukraine. Um, and in addition to just the Zelensky-Biden meetings, we shouldn't ignore that there were a number of other senior level meetings with the Zelensky delegation uh, in Washington <clears throat> with a number of senior U.S. officials, uh, also with the U.S. Congress, uh, which expressed strong support uh, for strengthening the relationship. So, uh, but before we hand off the baton uh, to our colleagues, and I'm going to turn to my colleague, Ora, shortly, um, I just want to add just a couple of observations that is, you know, just from Washington, even though we're not fully focused on, on sort of the Washington viewpoint. Uh, one is, um, you know, I think there is, at least from those of us here, um, some deep appreciation that <clears throat> despite challenges over the last several months in the relationship, both ups and downs, that there was a lot of effort, intense effort that went in both in Washington and Kiev by officials on both sides to make this not just a photo op visit of President Zelensky, uh, and President Biden, but it, but it was much more substantive than that. And all, all you have to do is one is to look at the breadth of uh, what was a six page joint statement on the US-Ukraine strategic partnership that was released as part of the conversation to see that that not only, you know, obviously Nord Stream 2 remains a focus, but much beyond that, um, that there's areas where the United States and Ukraine um, can deepen relationship and its partnership in a more substantial way. And I think that document did this. So when you look at it, you see a strong U.S. commitment to Ukraine beyond security and defense, including support for democracy, justice, human rights, energy and climate, economic growth, prosperity, pandemic support, humanitarian assistance support. And I think it was quite substantial. As President Biden said, the partnerships between our nations grow stronger and it's going to it's going to be even stronger than it has been. And I take, I think many of us in Washington, that even with those that have had concerns on issues such as Nord Stream 2, felt that this was positive, that this was some substance, putting more meat on the bone in the relationship, which has evolved over the past 30 years um, uh, at different periods. And I think this is a new era in that relationship, we hope. But the thought, that strong language we understand, uh, and for us here too, who are focused on this, and the think tank community, the NGO world, and I, I'm sure within the administration's implementation of the agreements. What does that look like? Um, and reinvig reinvigorating the Strategic Partnership Commission um, is going to be, I think, pretty important for that. It's at a higher level than it was previously with Secretary Blinken 
um, and the Ukrainian foreign minister leading that effort. Um, and we know that there's going to be a need beyond even the initial vaccines, uh, additional support. We may hear more about that today coming from President Biden as he convenes a COVID-19 session at the UN. And I would just want to add to just on, on the energy agenda, we know, um, and, you know, when we're looking at it from here, we can already see some, some concerns and some cracks um, in, on the Nord Stream 2 issue. Um, we have seen the Biden administration, even over the last several days, express concern about Russia's restrictions on national gas exports. Um, and we've seen people commenting on that concern. So it's incredibly important, I think, even if one agrees or disagrees with what took place between the United States and Germany uh, in, in July, um, that we want to see and we hope to see these commitments that were made within that, that agreement to Ukraine fulfilled. And I think those issues are going to be, it's pretty clear things are going to be, there are going to be some challenges immediately on that front and commitments that were made to Ukraine uh, need to be backed up both by the United States and Germany. So we have this joint uh, statement on strategic partnership. Um, there's a number of item, items in that partnership with Ukraine that will need to be fulfilled in the near and the long term. And I would just add this, I think there is higher expectations on the US side, and I, I know colleagues from Ukraine are gonna speak about this today um, and wanna hear from your end, um, on the issues of democracy and rule of law and combating corruption in Ukraine. Um, and, you know, as it was laid out, these things were essential to Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic integration, um, defending against uh, the Kremlin's continued aggression. And I think it was pointed out, and I thought really important in the language, that Ukraine's success is central to the global struggle between democracy and autocracy. Um, and so I think there's a number of areas where reforms were laid out that I'm, I'm sure you will go into, uh, but it's always important, I think, one, to hear from civil society, expert communities, because we know this was um, an agreement on paper, but we saw such things as additional uh, funding for defense and security, a number of new agreements uh, that were reached, and we're really looking forward to hearing from all of you uh, today, and also we'll have an opportunity from, for Q&A from those who are participating, uh, that are listening in, to ask some questions. So we really want to understand whether or not this agreement uh, it can be a catalyst uh, for democratic reforms. We sh also should not lose sight of the Summit for Democracy um, as another, uh, another point in the road. It is my hope that Ukraine will be invited, the Ukrainian government but it's another way to make certain that, that we build on uh, the agreements that were reached and commitments, both from the Ukrainian government and from the US government. With that said, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Oris. Uh, Oris, um, I know that you, Oris, I don't know if you, uh, Dejakuski, um, Oris, if you're there, um, we'd welcome you sort of coming in, sort of uh, also providing your thoughts on the U.S. perspective, and, and I think, uh, I, I don't speak for everybody in Washington, but I, I do think people were very pleased that, that this meeting happened, um, and there's still a number of challenges, but I know that you have been not only looking at this, but writing about it, so Orest, over to you. Uh, thanks, Jonathan. Thank you very much. I think what you're going to hear from me is a little bit of reinforcement of what you said. Um, Thank you very much to RPR in Kiev and German Marshall Fund in Washington, uh, who are our, our transatlantic task force in Ukraine, invaluable partners and a warm welcome and uh, special thanks to our distinguished speakers for agreeing to share their perspectives and, and to all of you joining us today. You know, a few words that come to my mind in describing Zelensky's visit to Washington are encouraging and reassuring, especially after some of the turmoil that the U.S.-Ukraine relationship experienced under the previous administration. Uh, the visit was a return to normality and, and some semblance of stability. It was a solid, if not spectacular, success with concrete, tangible results. And as Jonathan said, not only the White House meeting, but others with key cabinet officials in key areas for Ukraine, like Secretary Austin and Granholm and the congressional meeting. The visit has been characterized as getting U.S.-Ukraine relations back on track or on solid ground or on firm footing, that they have advanced, that the ball's been moved forward. These are the kinds of words and phrases you hear. And a clear message was sent 
I think, to both our friends and foes that the U.S. is committed to Ukraine's success and will not only continue, but intensify support for Ukraine in her struggle against Russia's ongoing aggression. So this seems to be the broad consensus here in the U.S. with understandably some U.S. observers more enthusiastic and others less so, depending on, you know, their own perspectives and sometimes, dare I say, their own political leanings and agendas. Could more have been achieved? No doubt about it. For instance, many Ukraine watchers, including myself, would have preferred larger additional assistance numbers, especially in the military security and even humanitarian spheres. But if things go the way we hope and expect they will, I'm confident we will see more. So while I didn't hear choir singing hallelujah, I also didn't really hear anyone serious call the meeting a failure. Now, as Jonathan said, the substantive joint statement underscores that Ukraine is among U.S. foreign policy priorities, recognizing, of course, that, you know, the U.S. being a global power, there are a lot of competing priorities. And again, as Jonathan said, but I think this is, this is important to underscore, and that's America's compelling interest in Ukraine. Um, in, in Ukraine, is the, it's a really powerful assertion that Ukraine's struggle is central to the global struggle between democracy and autocracy. And I believe that the joint statement offers a quite substantive roadmap for bilateral engagement. So we're off to a pretty good start. But as with anything else, follow-up and implementation is the key. And as Jonathan said, too, the reinvigoration of strategic partnership will be crucial in bolstering the relationship and in this whole implementation effort. So there's plenty of hard work ahead by both sides, especially, and everybody may not want to hear this, but especially by the Ukrainian side, as this is, after all, about helping Ukraine in its ongoing historic process of transformation and reforms. Difficult and uneven process, as our speakers know better than anybody else, one that is so essential to Ukraine's success, a success which, of course, too, is very much in U.S., European, and global interests. So I look forward to hearing from our distinguished speakers, discussing how to give more content and meaning to the commitments outline, security and defense and support of Ukraine's Euro-Atlantic aspirations and encouraging Ukraine's economic growth and prosperity and advancing Ukraine's energy security, including, you know, Jonathan expanded on this, addressing the impact of Nord Stream 2, humanitarian assistance, and last, but by no means least, supporting Ukraine's rule of law reforms, especially reforming the judiciary and combating corruption that really underpin everything else and where there is still a long way to go. Um, the cold, hard reality is that progress on rule of law will greatly determine the quality, not only of our bilateral U.S.-Ukraine relations, but that of Ukraine's very future. And with that, I thank you, and I turn it over to Olena and Keith. Thank you very much, Horace. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, dear colleagues, thank you for taking the time to join us today and welcome to the briefing on the outcomes of um, arguably the most anticipated bilateral event of the recent months for Ukraine. Uh, and although this meeting between President Zelensky and Biden did not result in any uh, particular surprises, it has cemented um, the very specific and actionable priorities in revitalizing uh, Ukraine-US relations. And um, in the past three weeks, as colleagues mentioned, and um, the expert community on both sides of the Atlantic uh, had an opportunity to analyze the joint statement in which the meeting resulted and to develop the list of concrete um, next steps to advocate. So um, today we would like to go beyond the general assessment of the meeting's outcomes and to dive deeper into specific commitments undertaken by both sides in the security governance, uh, energy and uh, economic spheres. Uh, in particular, we would like to hear what uh, Ukraine's leading civil society experts uh, expect from the reinvigorated strategic partnership committee between uh, Ukraine and the US. Uh, will the reset of this committee uh, actually make it an effective platform 
for bilateral dialogue, uh, which of these commitments um, declared in the statement should be the priority for both governments and which are most at risk, and how can the larger international community contribute to their implementation? Um, are these commitments realistic even, and how do they relate to the political environment in Ukraine and the US? Uh, does this environment allow for the implementation of these mutual promises in the foreseeable future? We can see from the Ukrainian side that the Ukrainian polit political climate uh, remains quite heated. The new political season has just started bringing on the parliamentary agenda some uh, high profile legislation on limiting the influence of oligarchs on the economy, as well as um, a highly controversial taxation bill and the long overdue uh, national anti corruption strategy until 2024 among many other uh, important bills. The parliament chairman, Rosenkov, is very likely to be dismissed in the, in the matter of weeks. The new government reshuffle is on the way with at least three ministers up for dismissal, including defense minister. Uh, the budgeting process has started. The judicial reform is on the edge of being nullified. Um, and on top of that, Ukraine is entering another wave of COVID-19. All of these factors, of course, um, make a strong U.S. Lena, you're frozen. Elena, Elena disappeared at the moment, no voice. Well, why don't we, Dennis, can you, um, do you wanna pick up on your end just as we wait and sort of rework? Uh, um, I know Elena was going to introduce all the speakers, and I know we have limited time on on sort of all ends. Um, and um, and I know she was sort of laying out. I'm sure a lot of you have thoughts and comments, even on the initial layout of the of the environment in in Ukraine right now. Um, but but Dennis, did you want to maybe do just a quick intro, and then when Elena comes back in, we'll just you know, um, she'll pop back in. I know she'll be moderating. So thank you. And thank you for bearing with us. So, so Dennis, um, pinch hitting over to you. Thank you, John. Um, uh, well, basically, um, uh, today we're going to discuss all the crucial moments of the, uh, of the deal, I would say, uh, of the uh, uh, GN statement of both parties. And I sincerely hope a lot of them will join us. Uh, and um, uh, I want to present our speakers. Uh, uh, today we uh, have uh, Olana Tragub as uh, head of uh, NACO, uh, which is an anti corruption organization focused on uh, defense and security reform. Uh, we also have uh, Mikhailo Zhernakov, uh, who is one of the most prominent experts on judicial reform and who is the head of the Euro Foundation. Uh, we also have um, uh, Igor Borakovsky, uh, who is um, a member of the board of uh, Renovation Package of Reforms Coalition and uh, head of uh, Institute of Economic uh, Research and Political Consultations. Uh, and uh, Oleg uh, Savitsky uh, also joined us, to, joined us today, uh, who is a member, he is an expert uh, um, uh, on energy sector reform, and uh, he is also a member of the board of uh, uh, Eco Action uh, NGO. Uh, good to see uh, all of you, and thanks for joining us today. Uh, and I see Olena uh, has come back. Uh, yes, and, yes, and I guess we can start with the speakers. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dennis, for stepping in. Um, I really apologize for the internet. Um, issues. Um, yes, uh, I would like to pose our first question to Olana Trihub. Olana, your organization uh, recently published the analysis of uh, Zelensky-Biden meeting where you stated that its key implications um, are the U.S. commitment of a strengthened uh, security assistance to Ukraine and Ukraine's commitment to accelerate the reform of the state defense concern Ukrobron Prom, to reform uh, defense procurement um, and the security service of Ukraine, and to strengthen uh, democratic and civilian oversight um, over the military. Uh, do you believe that uh, there is sufficient capacity and political will on the Ukrainian side to deliver on these commitments? And how can uh, this enhance cooperation? How how can these commitments enhance Ukraine's uh, 
ability to fight Russian aggression in, in Ukraine's east. The floor is yours, Elena. Uh, thank you, Elena. Um, indeed, uh, their joint statement specified those uh, reforms that you mentioned. Um, and um, it's important that the United States actually uh, uh, they, they have dialogue with Ukraine around very specific reforms, such as the very complicated reform, which is now going on in the Ukrainian parliament reform of the security service of Ukraine, for example. Um, those are all uh, uh, very complex reforms that have a lot of um, resistance within the system. Um, not necessarily from uh, oligarchs, because uh, um, this is not uh, some major economic interests, but these are reforms that have a, a very big um, a resistance from the, uh, you know, mid-level officials, people who work in uh, law enforcement system, people who work in uh, uh, Ukrainian Ministry of Defense, for example. And I just, um, to answer your question, uh, whether there is political will, I should address the question that th there is this resistance. And uh, we see that President uh, Zelensky already demonstrated political will and uh, to adopt a certain uh, legislation, which was never adopted uh, under the former President Poroshenko. Here, I mean uh, the adoption of the new procurement uh, law uh, which took place um, more than a year ago, which was supposed to make defense procurement more transparent, more competitive. Uh, also, uh, I'm talking about adoption of the new law on uh, the transformation of Ukrainian defense industry, which is supposed to um, transform Ukroboronprom into a joint stock uh, company. Um, and those uh, import, and also it's the beginning of this uh, legislative process on uh, reform of security service of Ukraine. Um, these are all reforms uh, that were expected from us uh, actually after Maidan, uh, but now um, they, they were delayed, especially um, the reform of security service of Ukraine, because obviously, Security service is uh, 32,000 uh, people and they don't want to be fired. They don't want to lose their corruption uh, revenues. And uh, the resistance is huge. And even though we see this political will from the top, maybe we don't see enough, you know, willingness to really fight with all these people to actually push for those reforms. And this also goes about this uh, procurement bill, which I mentioned, even though it was adopted one year ago, it has not basically started to work yet because the um, government officials on the level of the Ministry of Defense, on the level of the Ministry of Strategic Industries did not adopt uh, the necessary secondary legislation to enable the work of the new procurement system. And uh, also uh, Ukuroboron from transformation has been delayed significantly also by basically governmental officials who have still this old uh, mindset and who uh, are not interested in such fast transformation. Therefore, I hope that, uh, you know, if uh, the commission between US and Ukraine will start working actively then um, there will be more push from the United States, more interest in these reforms, and it will help to overcome this resistance. Essentially, from what uh, our organization has observed so far, um, their partnership, of course, between uh, the international partners, their policymakers and uh, civil society is key to push through difficult reforms. Sometimes, uh, even if their um, President Zelensky wants to ha have some reform happen, but this partnership is not there, there is not enough pressure, uh, he's not even able, his office is not able and his party, uh, they are not able to push through th something which is uh, very difficult. And Mikhailo will speak after me 
um, he will tell you exactly the same about the judiciary because Ukrainian judiciary, they don't want to be reformed. In defense and security sector, it's exactly the same uh, uh, issue. Um, so that's my basically answer to your question and I can elaborate on other topics of the visit if you like in security and defense. Thank you very much, Elena. Uh, I also have a follow-up question on the anticipated dismissal of the Minister of Defense, Andriy Charan. Uh, do you think this reshuffle will affect uh, Ukraine's implementation of its security and defense commitments outlined in the joint statements? And how? What are the? Uh, what what can be the implications of this dismissal in general, specifically considering who uh, are considered for the um, new defense minister, considering the candidates? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. The conversation about potential dismissal of the Minister of Defense, Taran, and also um, the Vice Prime Minister for Strategic Interests, Oleh Huruski, has been uh, in place for, um, for a while, for actually several months now. And um, if, we on, if we ask the question, for example, why there is significant delay right now in uh, defense procurement, why the law on defense procurement is not implemented, who are the top officials responsible for that? I would answer it's Taran and Uruski. It's very clear because those two agencies had uh, the biggest responsibility. And um, they, they also had other multiple failures. Uh, in, and they, um, if you evaluate their activity in the last year, you see that they we're delaying reforms rather than actually accelerating them. So hopefully, if the uh, leadership decides to replace them, hopefully they will be replaced with somebody who will implement those reforms faster. This is the logical uh, you know, outcome that uh, uh, should be tried to achieve because uh, essentially um, this uh, delay uh, it's, it's, it's not good, you know, for Ukraine, not only from the strategic perspective, whether the United States will enhance cooperation and trust it better, but it's also, of course, bad for the national security of Ukraine. It's bad for our defense capability. Uh, we're talking about, you know, a country, our country, which is now in active uh, military conflict uh, fighting uh, in the East and uh, we can we have situations when our armed forces do not have enough uh, supplies they don't have enough uh, you know their equipment is not repaired uh, timely these are very dangerous things and uh, therefore uh, the, the um, delay of the execution of the state defense order as it is happening now it should not be tolerated it should uh, be uh, the demand should be from the next officials who take those positions um, if there is a reshuffle. The demand should be that they should be uh, execute all these reform plans and procurement plans in a timely manner because the time is of the essence in, in Ukraine situation. Thank you very much again, Olena. It's good to hear that you're optimistic about this possible reshuffle and we will obviously follow closely. Well, we don't know uh, the names yet. So we don't know the names. There are multiple names that are circulating. One of the problem is that it becomes really hard uh, to find good candidates who would be ready to do this uh, work. There is not enough uh, talent currently, unfortunately, uh, in, in this uh, government uh, uh, field and uh, it's an issue. It's an issue. And who do you think are the most likely candidates to be appointed? Well, the names that we see are the current head of Ukraborn from uh, Yuri Gusev, uh, also the um, member of parliament uh, Irina Verishchuk, also um, the um, uh, member of president's office uh, Roman Mashovets. All these names are being circulated. Mm -hmm. Well, 
Thank you again. Yes, we will, we will follow closely what happens next. Uh, and now I'd like to give the floor to Mihailo uh, Zhernakov. Mihailo, uh, how strong, in your opinion, is the governance uh, section of the joint statement between uh, the uh, United States and Ukraine? And is the Ukrainian leadership uh, serious about doing its part? Because the uh, recent uh, alarming developments around the judicial reform unfortunately suggest otherwise so we would appreciate hearing from you what the state the state of affairs is right now and what your expectations are thank you Elena. thank you colleagues uh, very happy to be here i have to apologize in advance i i have limited time today and uh, i'll have to catch the trains uh, uh, in, in in about uh, in about an hour or so i have to leave in about 40 minutes or so so if you have any questions please uh, I, I would like to invite you to address them uh, or to post them uh, quite soon, so I'd be um, able to, to answer them. Uh, yes, as judiciary, uh, thank you, Olena. I, I thought the same, uh, obviously mentioned in the Zelensky Biden statement and uh, uh, how the judiciary and its, its place of, uh, in the platform in it. As judiciary is the least, or one of the least trusted uh, public institutions and it's captured by the oligarchs who use it to uh, keep the monopoly stance on the market and to uh, I don't know, to gain property and power and money. Um, it, is, it is a big problem and it, it's been uh, on the agenda for quite some time. But I have to uh, recognize right now, um, which is a good news, that it is uh, probably the highest on the agenda of uh, US-Ukraine relationships ever. Um, and uh, uh, also in the, in the other international documents and, and oblig obligations that ha Ukraine has before the international partners and agreements uh, it, it is all over the place luckily uh, it is in, in the IMF memorandum it is in the EU memorandum it is uh, uh, a number one um, Secretary Blinken when he came to Ukraine he mentioned it is a number one priority and it is a number one priority in in joint uh, Zelensky Biden statement uh, that that was released uh, when when Zelensky was was when President Zelensky was in in uh, in DC so it is the good news it is very um, high on the agenda. The less good news is that despite that, uh, it's, it's, it is very far from done. Uh, we faced um, a, a historic vote uh, this July in the parliament when uh, the parliament adopted uh, two uh, bills on the reform and the very ambitious reform of the judiciary uh, aimed at, at reshuffling or rather rebooting the uh, judicial governance bodies that are um, that are the core of the problem uh, in Ukraine's judiciary uh, and who, who would give the, uh, the rebooted ones who would uh, be the rather the instruments of, of further reform um, who would that would reboot the uh, and, and renew the, the judiciary itself and set the new standards uh, of integrity and professionalism that we uh, so badly need. However, um, after that, uh, when the implementation stage kicked in, um, we, I fear, repeated the same mistake that we made uh, many times. We delegated as a country, and when I say we, we, I mean as a country, we delegated too much power to the same judiciary we would like to reform. And uh, basically we were given the council of judges, the judicial self-governance body, um, the, um, authority to name the experts, the representatives of the judiciary to the ethics council, that, uh, that is the body that is aimed at re reforming the high council of justice, the highest uh, judicial institution in Ukraine that is pretty much responsible for the rest, for the, for the state of the rest of the judiciary. And now for more than uh, a month and a half, uh, it is not um, doing their job and refusing to nominate these experts, but trying to find whatever reason uh, it, it's, it's become ridiculous, I have to say, how they're trying to avoid uh, their responsibility and uh, actually fulfilling uh, their obligation before the law. Um, they had the whole month provided for by the law to delegate these, these uh, experts. They, they did not, uh, because again, I have to, to say that um, the Ethics Council, the body that has to reform the High Council of Justice, has to, be, uh, has to consist of half the independent international experts, uh, which, which is a very good recipe, and we know that because of the uh, history of the creation of the High Anti-Corruption Court, that it works very well. It is a success story, and it has to be scaled, and uh, it, is a, it is an attempt at that. 
So the international experts, the international organizations delegated very good experts. The Council of Judges fails to, to delegate three Ukrainian judges for more than a month now. So they violated all the deadlines provided, uh, set out by the law, and they um, now are finding uh, a million reasons to delay this process to uh, just yesterday they adopted a regulation that even further delay, delays it for more than a month. Uh, and uh, uh, today the, the head of the Council of Judges, Mr. Monich, said basically that he thinks that uh, whatever is the, uh, whoever applies uh, with the current edition of the law, uh, he sees that they may not delegate uh, anybody at all to, to the Ethics Council, which um, puts everybody in a very awkward situation, I must say, because um, all eyes are on, on, on this reform and it came to uh, the indecisiveness or rather the, the active sabotage of a few uh, people uh, who are judges in Ukraine who don't want to be reformed, who don't, do not want their colleagues to be scrutinized. That is why they're actively sabotaging pretty much the, uh, the, the whole reform. And, and this is a very sad development. Unfortunately, I have to say that uh, Zelensky and his administration also took a, a, a very strange, I must say, uh, stance where they uh, basically said they will not, uh, publicly they, they said they will not let the, the law be sabotaged or the reform be sabotaged, but uh, instead of uh, doing uh, and, and something actively, they just uh, um, initiated one meeting where the G7 countries uh, including the representatives of the U.S., obviously, and uh, the judges and the uh, uh, and the members of the parliament talked for two and a half hours. It uh, pretty much nothing came out of it, apart from one statement that says, "Oh, we have to to make the reform happen." And after that, the the judges keep doing nothing and actively sabotaging the reform. So um, uh, here, I I will finish with uh, um, with my um, understanding of what is going on and, and, and really what uh, has to be done, I have a strong feeling that whoever will um, say uh, source of a problem, whoever's, whoever's official inaction is in place, the political responsibility, both before the people of Ukraine and the international partners of Ukraine, um, including the US, or first and foremost the US, um, is, is still uh, the person is who is responsible politically is still President Zelensky. And I think it is his, it is absolutely in his um, power to uh, reverse the situation and, and uh, convince the judges to, to uh, uh, fulfill their role. And uh, we really feel, I really hope that after uh, President Zelensky comes back from the US, from the UN, uh, he uh, really devotes more attention to that because if we, um, again, if we let this, this reform uh, fail again, uh, I, I fear that uh, we will not have such a chance in many, many years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mihailo. Um, all factors considered, what's your forecast? Will the judicial reform survive this time around? And, and again, what can international partners do to, to save it and, and to urge the government to finally uh, deliver not only on this reform, but also on, on the broader range of rule of law reforms? Well, uh, I am convinced that uh, if President Zelensky really uh, wants things to happen, because I, uh, I do think that he personally uh, is, is, uh, wants reform to succeed. Otherwise, why, why engage in all these and, uh, and be an author of the law that fails for the second time? We had a very similar story back in 2019, where the same judiciary uh, pretty much sabotaged a very similar similar law. Uh, so um, why would why, why let the judiciary do that for the second time, right? Um, but I do think some people inside Zelensky's administration have ulterior motives and uh, their own interests. And uh, that is why they're, they're trying to kind of uh, separate uh, Zelensky from um, the issue and, and manage it somehow and then say, oh, uh, maybe try to help judiciary win time to kill it in the constitutional court or whatever it is. It is very vague. So uh, my, my point is I, I cannot make um, predictions right now because as of now, it doesn't look very well. And it looks like it is going to fail. 
But I am, again, I, I have to repeat, I'm, I'm convinced that if President Zelensky himself wants to things to happen, he, he will find ways for it to happen. And the international community, I think the best way that we, we all can do, or the best thing that we can all do, is to find ways to talk directly to President Zelensky, address him directly, and encourage him to not let this reform die again. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Mihailo. And we remind our audience that uh, you can still uh, post questions to Mihailo while he's still here with us for the next um, about 40 minutes, as far as I understand. Um, and meanwhile, we are uh, turning to the uh, uh, climate and energy section of the joint statement. And I would like to um, to uh, address my next question to Oleg. Uh, looking at the uh, agreements in the energy section of the joint statement, uh, such as establishing a strategic energy and climate dialogue, um, attracting energy sector investments through reform, uh, reducing greenhouse gas emissions, addressing the impact of Nord Stream 2, uh, how aligned are these um, are these um, commitments uh, with the Ukrainian government's energy and climate agenda? How how realistic again is uh, the implementation of these commitments, given what's on the actual agenda of the government right now? Oleg, the floor is yours, please. Uh, thank you, Elena. Uh, this is really a very important miles, milestone in uh, bilateral relationships, and we, uh, for the first time, have uh, the issue of climate change uh, at uh, this uh, top level uh, of uh, negotiations. And uh, this is really a milestone. And uh, uh, the language on the climate issues is quite uh, strong and uh, specific. And uh, uh, the statement uh, is uh, clear that uh, both countries are taking the climate crisis seriously and uh, that uh, cooperation in energy uh, sector will be uh, addressing climate change uh, actively and responsibly. And uh, I would say that this is uh, a really a leap uh, forward uh, uh, for, for, uh, for Ukraine uh, and uh, linking energy security and uh, climate issues is uh, what was uh, uh, being uh, addressed by NGOs for the last decade because uh, Ukraine's critical dependence on uh, uh, supplies of fossil fuels uh, and uh, uh, petrol from uh, Russia and Belarus is a, a really a, a heavy leverage for uh, the Kremlin uh, in the terms of uh, economic and political influence and we know the, the story with uh, Medvedchuk and the uh, diesel pipeline, which was pumping money into uh, the media that were uh, actively uh, doing an uh, information war inside the, the country. Uh, so uh, I would say that this is a really uh, a very important development that we have this in statement. This is a, a very welcomed um, uh, development and uh, it uh, brings more optimism uh, towards energy sector reforms. And we know that uh, uh, major obstacles uh, to decarbonization uh, in Ukraine and uh, energy sector reform is the grab of oligarchs and also pro-Russian uh, oligarchs over uh, energy infrastructure. We know that Firtash uh, owns uh, most of the gas distribution companies. Uh, Firtash, who is under uh, the extradition process to United States. And I hope uh, that uh, from uh, US side, uh, this issue will be solved finally, and uh, he will be brought uh, to justice. If not, if it's not possible in Ukraine, as you know, because of the uh, situation with judiciary, which was described by the previous uh, speaker, then, then we hope uh, that the uh, uh, U.S. will help to bring uh, this uh, culprit to justice in the United States. Uh, and uh, this will hopefully um, also make possible further, further uh, progress of the reform in the gas sector, which was very successful in, uh, on the uh, transmission level and uh, 
unbundling of uh, the NAFTA gas uh, uh, and uh, uh, the gas transmission uh, operator creation of the separate company uh, proved to be very successful and really uh, brought uh, major economic benefits also to Ukraine <laughs> and uh, security improved the, the energy security of the whole region and Europe uh, as a whole, uh, because now we have a, a really uh, professional and uh, accountable uh, management and uh, corporate governance uh, in the gas transmission system operator and NAFTA gas also uh, showed uh, significant progress in, in the uh, corporate uh, reform, uh, despite some issues that yeah we know about and uh, uh, the the management uh, of this such, such strategic company is also a, a political issue uh, as well. Um, yes, uh, so and uh, uh, this statement uh, uh, which. Uh, addresses um, uh, the Nord Stream uh, to uh, part and uh, create uh, and establishment of uh, the special position and uh, uh, consultant on, on the energy security issues uh, for, for Ukraine is uh, uh, really a very good development as well. And uh, I hope it will uh, help also Ukraine to. Uh, build more, um, I would say, uh, um, comprehensive and uh, uh, responsible uh, way to, to uh, uh, build uh, long-term policy in the energy sector, uh, because uh, now it's always uh, mixed. Uh, it's a mix of different interests and also uh, still energy policy in Ukraine is heavily influenced by Russia and we still have many uh, experts who are basically tied to uh, Russian businesses or oligarchs uh, and uh, are uh, uh, putting their agenda into Ukraine's energy policy. Uh, so I hope this uh, could be uh, uh, changed uh, with uh, stronger partnership with the United States. Uh, and uh, also, uh, I, I would also um, uh, uh, want to highlight the uh, uh, development uh, developments uh, in the nuclear sector, uh, parallel to uh, the meeting and visit of uh, uh, President Zelensky to the United States. The, uh, there were also a delegation of uh, uh, nuclear industry uh, uh, to of Ukrainian nuclear industry management to United States, and there were uh, two memorandums signed on uh, cooperation in nuclear energy sector. Uh, one with Westinghouse, and the uh, the second with New Scale. Uh, both uh, memorandums, uh, they are uh, quite significant uh, politically, uh, but uh, uh, they are questionable in terms of possibility of their implementation and how the realistic they are. But as a, a political sign, they were uh, very important because they uh, uh, signal that uh, uh, Ukraine is no longer considering uh, uh, possibility to uh, further develop nuclear energy with Russia, as it was uh, historically, and we inherited uh, uh, Soviet technology and Soviet infrastructure, which is uh, uh, f f further uh, like owned the technology of uh, our re reactors and the nuclear power plants, they are owned by Russia. Uh, and uh, the, the former uh, uh, projects of new nuclear reactors were, were based on the Russian technology and there were also huge controversy uh, in last uh, eight years regarding the uh, construction of uh, two units at the Khmelnytsky nuclear power plant, which uh, basically was uh, the same Russian technology, but with uh, uh, intermediaries on the uh, uh, or registered in Czech Republic, but owned uh, still by uh, uh, Atom uh, Stroy Expert and the, uh, the, the Russian business. 
Uh, and uh, now we finally see that uh, we we uh, have we have uh, end uh, to this uh, story that uh, Ukraine uh, is turning away from Russia in the nuclear sector, but uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, cooperation. Uh, uh, will be successful uh, for further development with uh, the United States because there are many, many uh, problematic issues in Ukraine's energy sector, in its uh, management and uh, uh, oversight. Uh, we have a huge uh, corruption uh, issues regarding Energotum and uh, uh, multiple scandals, and uh, this year we, we had a scandal with the uh, compliance officer uh, 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 having a court uh, case against uh, Energoatom, uh, and uh, uh, he was uh, uh, he was. Uh, uh, like reintroduced to his position, but not, not successfully. And eventually uh, um, uh, Energoatom doesn't uh, have uh, anti-corruption oversight right now. And uh, what is even more concerning that uh, uh, according to recent uh, governmental decisions, uh, both Energoatom and the state uh, nuclear uh, regulatory inspectorate of Ukraine, they are uh, uh, now uh, under the management of uh, the cabinet of ministers. They, they are overseen by the same officials. And this brings uh, the regular nuclear regulator uh, in, in the dependent uh, position and they cannot uh, now uh, provide a, independent oversight of uh, uh, Energoatom's uh, activities and decisions. And uh, this actually, uh, this, that uh, move by the government has strengthened uh, the position of Energoatom's management and uh, uh, reduced their responsibility and accountability. Uh, and uh, it, what, what is uh, most concerning for the public that uh, we are not sure uh, that, that they uh, know what they are doing. <laughs> and, uh, Alec, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you. Sorry, I have to interrupt you right here because uh, I wanted to pose another question to you and then we have to uh, turn to um, our next speaker. But um, my follow-up question would be, uh, since you represent the civil society, civil society organization, uh, do you believe there's sufficient coordination between uh, the government of Ukraine and the civil society in the energy and climate sector? Uh, because this will... Uh, in many ways, uh, also determine uh, how effectively the joint statements uh, uh, commitments are implemented. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, uh, the Ministry of Energy is uh, quite uh, closed uh, to uh, NGOs and uh, not very cooperative uh, on many issues, such as uh, the uh, uh, modernization of the infrastructure and uh, uh, reduction of uh, hazardous emissions from uh, large combustion plants. Uh, there is uh, also huge um, like controversy and debate uh, regarding the, the fate of the, the, of the coal uh, uh, thermal power sector and the ministry is not uh, able to provide a realistic solution. And the, the issue is uh, is like uh, in, in uh, constant uh, uh, discussion, and uh, the the ministry unfortunately is only translating uh, the the wishes of the industry, uh, which says we we need money from the state budget for our thermal power plants, and we want them to operate without uh, uh, environmental restrictions for another twenty years. So uh, how do you, how do you think uh, excuse me how do you think this um, coordination can be strengthened if it's so uh, poor right now how can it be strengthened uh, in the future? Well, we will see uh, what will happen with the government reshuffle and uh, uh, 
if the Minister of Energy will uh, uh, remain at his position, but if uh, uh, we are serious about the turn uh, towards European and uh, European Atlantic integration, that uh, we need some really uh, uh, more uh, like <laughs> committed uh, management uh, for the energy sector towards this direction because uh, uh, the current minister, uh, there are uh, many uh, like uh, claims and uh, uh, accusations from the experts and public uh, on his links to uh, oligarchs and uh, uh, that he doesn't work in the national interest. Thank you very much, Oleg. Um, and while we still have Mihailo with us, I would like to uh, address uh, two of the questions that we received from our audience to Mihailo. The first of them uh, comes from Susan Stewart. She is um, uh, asking whether uh, uh, panelists, including Mihailo, believe that there is sufficient pressure um, coming from the US side regarding the reform agenda. And the second question, I'll probably um, yeah, voice it um, uh, right away. Um, to paraphrase the question, uh, Lyubov Ostrovska is asking uh, why the Ukrainian government does not um, reform the judiciary on the basic level and then uh, along the way adjusts uh, the judicial system. Uh, as far as I understand the question, uh, Lyubov is wondering uh, why not um, move forward with the with the basic reform plan and then um, uh, and then adjust it and make it more um, and make it um, more um, effective along the way, uh, meaning that uh, if uh, the government is too ambitious at the outset of the reform, it may not achieve it, but if it goes with the um, with the basic scenario it may have a chance to um, to to improve the reform and the judiciary along the way. So yeah, the first question is about the sufficiency of the US uh, government's pressure on uh, the Ukraine government on reforms. And the second one is um, about um, choosing between the ambitious scenario of the judicial reform and a more realistic one. Mihailo, the floor is yours. Uh, Hello, I think you're muted. Sorry, I think there's something wrong with the with the headset. Is is that all right right now? Yeah, it is. Okay, cool. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so the, the first question. Um, yes, I do also believe that there should be. I've also heard that uh, uh, the, the Biden Zelensky uh, discussion was mostly about the security issues and very little, if any, about the reforms which uh, I think is, is uh, well, security obviously is a very important uh, issue, but uh, we will not be secure ever if we keep the courts and the uh, law enforcement like this in Ukraine. That's, I, 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 I kind of stress this enough. So it, these are things that are very much interlinked and that is why they should be linked all together. Uh, and we do believe the civil society organizations has been working for decades uh, for uh, justice reforms in Ukraine, that uh, the NATO integration issue, uh, well, the two should be linked together and conditioned to a, to a very large extent. Of course, the uh, help with fighting a war with Russia shouldn't rely on certain, I don't know, votings on the, of the laws or, or, or whatever. But I think that things such as the NATO integration that the current government really um, pursued a lot uh, recently, and, and speaks a lot about, which is, a, which is a good thing, but I think it should be strictly conditioned to top five or a very limited number of reforms that, um, so basically we need a plan uh, in, the, in the end of which there is NATO integration, a real thing, but uh, which also should be strictly con linked to certain things, certain very important and very uh, deep changes inside, inside Ukraine's uh, judiciary security service, things that have to uh, do with, with security issues, actually. Because what is Russia doing lately is essentially it weaponizes um, 
corruption and dependence of the Ukraine's judiciary to undermine reforms, to undermine Ukraine's sovereignty and um, um, ability to resist and, and fight the war. So uh, I, I shared the link where um, kind of moving slow, m slowly to the, to the second question, where I uh, try to, to explain in, in several words what, what is Ukraine's judiciary, what, what Ukraine's judiciary really is. And uh, uh, it, it, doesn't, it, it doesn't work this way that you, we take one case and then we um, fine tune one thing somehow and, and call it judicial reform. Ukraine's judiciary is deeply corrupt. It's number one problem uh, that the experts and the, and the public sees. It is, it is dependent on politicians and oligarchs. Uh, the judges themselves are the number one problem. They're essentially a criminal syndicate that is uh, inside the country, which, which their own rules and, and um, plans to capture the whole country, pretty much. Uh, there's millions, maybe there's millions and millions, let's, let's put it this way, of uh, just, in just one case of the NABO, the National Anti-Corruption Bureau, seized $5 million in cash in the apartments of one of the uh, chief justices of one of the courts in Kyiv. This is the scale of corruption we're talking about. It's just one of the, one of the flats, one of the places that, where he kept his, his corrupt money. It, it, is not, it, it, it is not enough to, we try to do smaller things maybe to help judges better issue. No, it's, it, is, it has become evident that the whole system has to be rebooted, overhauled. And for that, we need um, a, to reboot the judicial governance bodies, this is number one priority. B to uh, include the independent international experts into this process the way we did with the high anti-corruption court, because um, time and time again, Ukraine's judiciary uh, showed that they are incapable of reforming themselves, and uh, uh, the same the same goes with the uh, Ukraine's um, politicians who, who are also interested, many of them in keeping the old corrupt system and uh, profiting from it. Uh, I hope that answers your questions. Thank you. Uh, Alana might be frozen again, unfortunately. Um, uh, Dennis, you want to maybe just jump back into, I don't know if there was uh, any, Michaela, if there was any other questions uh, in the Q&A section. Okay. Hello? Let I, I see you uh, with the hand raised. Yes, I'm... Just... Can you... Well, Elena, you're back, okay. So we, um, Elena also had her yes. hand raised and wanted to respond. Yeah, I just wanted briefly to add to what uh, Mihailo said about the political uh, pressure, the pressure of um, you know our international strategic partners. Um, in our sector, in defense and security sector, uh, we 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 have this uh, tricky situation uh, that indeed uh, we are country at war. So if uh, there is conditionality to US assistance, US security assistance, uh, for example, such conditionality more than a year ago was to declassify our defense procurement. Uh, if this conditionality is not uh, met, then uh, is US supposed to stop the security assistance? Of course not, because uh, we are still fighting Russia and we need this assistance. And um, uh, unfortunately, we see that, um, well, because of that, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, such pressure cannot be uh, produced. And our governmental officials, they know well that uh, uh, still uh, US will be uh, supporting us uh, strategically. Uh, so uh, my suggestion is that uh, US uh, should uh, simply uh, strengthen their effort in uh, you know, uh, sending uh, people, advisors here on the ground and helping like practically like push these reforms forward because um, uh, otherwise this delay will just stay uh, and you know, uh, we will not have a major breakthrough in the coming months.
thank you. Thank you, Elena. And um, we have one more question to Mihailo. Is Mihailo still with us? Uh, yes, I'm here. Um, yeah, uh, the question comes from Bohdana Depo. She's asking, um, is it somehow possible to measure the degree of the rule of law judicial re reform? Otherwise, for years, we will continue with the uh, common statement, Ukraine is corrupt, no rule of law with judiciary. Uh, thank you, Bohdana. This is a very interesting and, and, and important question. I'm just, I was just typing in the answer. Now, I, I think I'll make it available for um, everybody. I didn't finish typing it, but... Uh, uh, what I was trying to say, there is, uh, there are, what comes to my mind, there are at least two, uh, there is uh, EU Eastern Partnership and uh, OECD instruments that track that um, in, with certain methodology, uh, which of course has its limitations, but you, you could see what uh, um, became better, what didn't. Uh, also, you, I sent a link to our website, we um, very often we, we post updates on what, uh, what is going on with the Ukraine's judiciary. You're welcome to, to visit it and, and, and look for the information there. Uh, I don't think we'll miss it when something good happens uh, and the Ukraine's judiciary will start getting better. Um, it, it will be all over the place, I think. Uh, problem is, uh, well, I also, I also do not agree that with, with the messaging that, oh, Ukraine is corrupt, there's, no, there's nothing to, um, you know, there's no progress, there's no future, it's, it's a failed state. It is essentially, it's very close to, to Russian rhetoric about uh, uh, Ukraine not being a state or being a failed state. I don't agree with this statement, but, uh, and that is why I do uh, agree with um, those colleagues who say, well, it, it is much better to see Ukraine. Yes, we, we, have, we have problems, obviously, we are trying to address them, but... Uh, trying to find instruments, again, such as the NATO integration plan to condition the important reforms and to uh, uh, look at Ukraine not as a source or, or, or the kind of infinite story of non-reforming, which is obviously not true, but as a, uh, in many ways, it, it is now a source of solutions in the, in, the, in the region because things such as NABU, such as the Prozoro um, state procurement system and, and, and many others are... Um, specifically fine-tuned for uh, the countries that, that find themselves in the situation uh, Ukraine is. And um, uh, in, in many ways, uh, our partners did, did a, a conference on, uh, it's called Zero Corruption uh, uh, Conference on, on, on the solutions, building institutions um, in both anti-corruption and, and justice. Uh, and I think um, it is also becoming a thing, uh, uh, Ukraine being actually a, a solution, not a problem. Uh, but, but again, uh, I, I think it doesn't, just to emphasize, I, I don't think it helps, uh, I agree with, with uh, Dana here, uh, I don't think it helps to, to talk about corruption indefinitely, I think it helps much more to talk about concrete solutions and not only talk about them, but condition certain things that Ukraine wants and Ukraine government is going for uh, on, on, these, uh, on these changes. Thank you. And I'll thank have to run, Mihailo. thank you very much okay. for the discussion. And if you have any questions, my contacts are, are, are on our website and, and the colleagues know where, where to find me. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, all the best. Thank you, Mihailo. And we're now turning to Ihor Burakovsky and the economic section of the joint statement. Um, Ihor, given the crowded um, economic agenda, Ukraine's economic agenda at the moment um, with the national anti-corruption, uh, with national economic strategy uh, up for implementation with the budgeting process, uh, starting with the IMF online mission, uh, taking place with the privatization um, process ongoing uh, and the new taxation bill causing a strong pushback from the business community how can Ukraine make the most of its um, mutual commitments outlined uh, in the joint uh, Ukraine-US statement? Uh, thank you very much for an opportunity to talk to everybody. Well, how much time do I have in order not to over overuse your attention? About five, seven minutes. Okay. <clears throat> so I would like well, to talk in a PowerPoint way. First of all, I would like to say that I do welcome actually well, special attention paid to the energy and climate chapter and uh, to the issues in uh, energy and climate, 
and uh, economic uh, growth and, and prosperity. But what I would like to say is that here actually definitely we need to discriminate what could be achieved through the cooperation between the United States of America and Ukraine from one side and from the other side actually uh, where we are cooperating with International Monetary Fund, European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, World Bank and on bilateral basis with the other countries. So well, this is a kind of package and definitely well my first point is that well, definitely in some cases well Ukraine uh, uh, needs well more precise and I would like to say more efficient cooperation of donors Otherwise, actually, well, the uh, uh, billions of dollars actually uh, given to Ukraine would be used not in, in not in a very efficient way. This is my first point: donors' coordination. Point number two, I would like to say that well, at the moment we are talking about well, not the commitments, we are talking about the intentions to do something, and it would be a kind of challenge from my point of view for both sides, for the States of America and for Ukraine, to fill this memorandum with a very specific, not only ideas, but also actually well, projects, actions, proposals, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And the next step, from my point of view, is much more important even than the first one. So memorandum is okay, but the next step well, to make it alive, to make Make it working uh, well that's something which refer, which refers which which uh, which uh, 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 requires well special special attention just actually well a couple of points which could be added well to this particular or actually well to develop the memorandum point number one well this is development of institutional capacity of ukrainian government uh, the problem is that very often actually well our international partners well committed a lot of money well to help ukraine but ukraine is simply unable to use all of them so in this particular case, we need actually well, to develop this institutional capacity, and this institutional capacity is not only about combating uh, uh, corruption, is not only about public administration reform, is actually, you know, well, much more complex issue. Point number two. Well, uh, we need well uh, actually well to uh, look in an opportunities which are not mentioned directly in the uh, in the uh, in the statement. First of all, I'm talking about public-private partnership because with our public-private partnership, it's really difficult to uh, implement a lot of infrastructure projects in Ukraine, and also actually without public-private partnership, it's really difficult to talk about efficient operation of military-industrial complex. Again, actually, I think that if there would be quite success stories of uh, American companies participating along the lines of public-private partnership with Ukrainian government, well, I think it would give a very important impetus for the development of uh, business, uh, for the improvement of business climate and well, some, uh, some other things. Point number three, trade regime. Well, uh, so far, at least actually recently, Ukraine enjoyed generalized system of preferences trade regime. Well, now uh, it's suspended because, well, as far as I understand right now, the Americans, uh, well, uh, the American government is uh, uh, trying or actually well, has a plan well, to reinstall it. Uh, well, and I think that actually well, we need well, to understand better what are the problems in terms of our trade, first of all, when it comes actually to the trade in services. I do agree that actually, well, it's a problem of uh, intellectual property rights, but I think that actually inter intellectual property rights, it's not only about misuse of intellectual property rights, a violation of intellectual property rights by the state officials, by the state bodies of government in Ukraine. Well, and it's mentioned directly in the, in the, in, in the, in the, uh, in the statement. I think that actually, well, the problem is much more bigger and should be taken, it should be taken quite seriously. A couple of specific issues. I think that Ukraine actually will, and we are forgetting well about, for example, such specific issues like, for example, Chernobyl, because Chernobyl is still there. We have a kind of plan how to uh, move with uh, Chernobyl, uh, 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 with uh, how to mitigate the cost of Chernobyl in the long run. And so far, actually, one instrument, which was called a nuclear safety account, has been already uh, closed. So we are looking for a new financial instrument, which has been already, uh, which has been already officially proclaimed. And here, actually, I think that the American American uh, support would be quite would be quite important. Green development has been already mentioned, and from my point of view, the problem with green development is that actually right now it's among the priorities. It should be the central priority of recovery uh, after after pandemic, after pandemic. 
a couple more issues, and uh, actually maybe well, I would uh, I would be uh, I would be ready well, to take to take some some questions. Well, uh, state-owned enterprises it's an eternal headache in the country, and I do agree that well right now actually well if Ukraine shows success in uh, reforming state-owned enterprises, definitely it would unlock a number of issues, a number of problems in the privatization process, and not only and not only. One more issue which is very important, which we are forgetting that well, Ukraine is highly monopolized economy. And in this particular case, actually, well, uh, the law on de-oligarchization of Ukraine, well, it's a, from my point of view, as a political statement. What we need to do, we need to increase and to make more politically independent the Ukrainian anti-monopoly committee. Ukrainian markets are highly monopolized. Well, it refers well to a number of markets starting from energy and even actually well, to producing of some, uh, of some goods and services here in the country. So that's something where anti-monopoly committee should, should, uh, should, uh, should step in. And finally, I, I would like to say that uh, actually, well, we uh, need also well to uh, uh, maybe able to revise somehow and actually will to pay more attention, not to revise, to pay more attention actually will to the uh, developments on local level. As you probably know, Ukraine has already finalized decentralization reform. Last year, we had elections at the local level. And right now, a number of things we are talking about uh, today, and we are going to talk about tomorrow, well, will be solved at the local level at the local of the so-called well, amalgamated communities and in actually, well, uh, making them really instruments of uh, meeting the local uh, interest, local social and economic development interest is something which is, which, is very, which is very important and which will determine somehow, well, the whole development of Ukrainian economy in general. And of course, actually, well, will help us well to solve some of the problems, some problems, uh, 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 some problems uh, 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 related well, to, different, to different fields of social, of social and economic, and economic life, life in the country. My final point is that will definitely actually, well, well, we need well somehow maybe to reconsider the role of uh, civil society here in this particular country. And we're judging from the question which was posed by one of the participants. Well, definitely civil society in Ukraine will must become more professional because in order actually to fulfill the watchdog functions, we need actually well, to have a strong analytical background. And very often uh, uh, civil society is a kind of generator of some ideas, not only the ideas, let's make something going better. We are generating uh, uh, pro uh, legislative proposals. We are generating also, you know, well, some, I would like to say, well, proposals for the parliament, for the government. And well, in this particular case, well, this professionalization, let's put it in such a way, of the civil society is a very important point, And it should be actually well supported, both from within and from outside. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Igor. Um, I would like you to uh, to expand a little more on the anti-oligarchs law uh, draft law, if possible. Um, as you know, it's on the parliamentary agenda, and some experts have broadly criticized it criticized it for being too soft on uh, the oligarchs. Uh, what measures do you think would be more proportional and more appropriate to uh, limit oligarchs' influence on decision making and on the economy? And and which institutions, uh, except the um, anti-monopoly committee, should be strengthened? For that to happen well uh, first of all actually i do consider well this well anti-oligarchic uh, law as a kind of a political statement maybe i'm not very much patriotic maybe actually well i'm not a big expert in this you know political and legal aspects but my point is that actually first we need to discriminate actually between the uh, political influence of the oligarchs and economic uh, functions of the oligarchs when we are talking about oligarchs in pure economic sense, if they are not violating the laws, if, you, if they are not violating anti-monopoly uh, principles, etc., 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 actually, well, they are actually well uh, Ukrainian producers, and as Ukrainian producers, they need actually well uh, equal, so to say, actually well uh, equal uh, equal uh, relationship with the government. This is point number one, but it's a kind of you know general philosophical issue. I do actually well uh, advocating well two issues which are to be solved in this country. First, con first issue, well, it's about, well, the increase of the role of the uh, anti-monopoly committee, because right now anti-monopoly committee is not only about actually, well, uh, 
competition is not only about breaking well uh, monopolized markets or, or something like that. It's also well about state assistance. Well, Ukrainian uh, uh, anti-monopoly committee today also performs well the function of the uh, actually well assessing what types of uh, what types of things are considered either as a uh, non-aid or aid issues. And it's very important because actually well when it comes to the privileges granted to the uh, to the to the or to the oligarchs well in economic way definitely well the something uh, the something which refers to the uh, to the uh, to the field of uh, fall, falls under falls under the uh, functions of anti-monopoly committee. The other point is well, that's about actually you know well the laws and actually the principles of lobbying activities. So here we'll definitely we need actually well, to uh, establish well a clear cut mechanisms how the lobbying is done here, and of course actually when it comes actually well, to the uh, to the uh, so to say well public control. Well, that's about actually well about the lobbyist registration. That's about, so to speak, actually, well, publish uh, what you paid well, to the political parties or not actually, well, you're paying well, to the political to the political party. Well, that's about actually, you know, well, political advertising and the number of other and the number of other things. Otherwise, actually, we cannot solve well, the problem of the oligarchs in Ukrainian economy because, again, actually, well, uh, judging from the first draft of this well, uh, anti-oligarchic law, I, frankly speaking, do not see a well, viable mechanism how to implement it in practice. Thank you very much, Yohor, for this comprehensive analysis. And we can now uh, turn to our audience for further questions. And I turn it to Jonathan in Washington for the Q&A. Jonathan? Yeah, um, you know, we're still, um, people are still um, weighing in, but I wanted to, uh, or just to ask you a question about the, about the, um, there is a, an effort, I think, to reinvigorate the U.S.-Ukraine Trade and Investment Council, which will be holding, I think, its tenth meeting this fall. Um, and and underpinning that is the uh, the Trade and Investment Cooperation Agreement, which will be discussed. Um, I put in our chat function, I think, between us. I just wanted to get your comments on what you'd like to, what you on the Ukrainian side, I'd like to see as part of that uh, of of that agreement, and then also. Uh, one of the things that was buried and sort of not really buried, but on page five of this uh, strategic document signed or sort of agreed to by Zelensky and Biden's team was uh, increase or at least initial amount of funding of $3 billion uh, from the Export Import Bank, XM, uh, the U.S. XM Bank on potential transactions. Um, and I wanted to know if you thought that that was a you know, how you, you know, how you and others sort of looking at economic engagement, um, how that number looks. And if I, you, I think there's a number of things that you mentioned that may be sort of in the way of increased U.S. investment in Ukraine. Uh, one of them is clearly judicial reform. But maybe you could speak to these, these two issues. One, you know, how, how the U.S. might, because I think this is the economic growth of prosperity is sort of at the end of this document, but it's really critically informative. It focuses on sort of key reforms, expanding commercial cooperation, uh, and then providing sufficient funding for growth. That's the XM import. And then also uh, maybe all, you know, really looking at, at this, this um, trade and investment cooperation agreement and the use of US Ukraine uh, trade and investment council. So it's a little bit in the weeds, but, but it shouldn't be buried because these are, you know, there's been a lot of talk um, over the last several years, uh, particularly since 2014, about uh, ensuring and increasing U.S. trade and investment in in Ukraine. So maybe you could speak to that. Well, uh, I do agree that actually, well, at the moment we need well to take a kind of stock of all the problems in our relationship, and I think that actually, well, maybe, maybe it's my point. Maybe, well, maybe I'm wrong, but well, definitely, maybe, well, uh, uh, under them, well, uh, both presidents were talked about the problem. But from my point of view, actually, we really need to take all the stock of the problems which are hampering our our economic and investment and investment investment cooperation. And one of the points has been already mentioned, well, that the point of intellectual property, intellectual intellectual property rights. This is point number one. Point number two, actually, well, uh, when it comes well to uh, the uh, role of the uh, United States of America here in Ukraine, well, definitely, well, the USA is not well, the biggest 
is not the biggest uh, 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 FDI uh, exportable to the country. If we take actually the statistics, well, it's about uh, European Union, it's about Germany, well, it's about, well, some former, so to say, well, uh, 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 offshore, uh, offshore, uh, offshore territories, because, well, the offshore territory status well, has been changing uh, during the last year. So, well, definitely, well, here is a lot of space for, there is a, there is a space for, for American companies coming here either directly from the States, or actually, well, some of them, as far as I understand, well, they're thinking about, well, coming to Ukraine from the uh, subsidiary is located, for example, in Europe, but not only in Europe, because today actually, well, the location of the company well, doesn't play a very important role when it comes well, to global to global business. I do think that actually at the moment, well, for us, it would be really difficult, you know, to develop well the trade using well the so-called uh, 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 value uh, link, uh, well, uh, technological links. And well, the, this you know what type of well, technological trade? Well, uh, global value chains. Global value chains will simply because of simply because of uh, actual well, distance between well, the markets. But who knows? Maybe well, we could develop these things well with the subsidiaries of, of American companies located 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 in Europe. And for this particular case, actually, it's very important for Ukraine well to develop a good relationship with the European Union to integrate with the European Union market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Well, I think that well, there's something. But of of course, actually, well, there is also, well, as far as I understand, well, uh, two potential issues. One is actually, well, the potential amount of trade. If you take, for example, well, the Las Vegas, well, uh, the States of America uh, 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 makes uh, approximately, well, 2%. 2% of Ukrainian export, why actually, well, the United States of America accounts for 7.5%, if I'm not mistaken, of Ukrainian import. So definitely, well, you are not, well, the biggest, our trading partner. And, well, from the other side, well, definitely, all the markets for Ukraine are very important. And I think that actually, well, maybe, well, not the, uh, not the relative figure, maybe not the share, but, well, the amount of the trade could be, uh, could be significantly, could be significantly, uh, could be significantly expanded. When it comes, actually, well, to trade to service, as well as a story, well, uh, it's a different story, which should be which should be discussed. And again, actually, well, uh, I think that well, at the moment, well, uh, uh, there are no very much barriers in terms of trade, which requires a kind of you know a political intervention. I think that actually much more is on the side of competitiveness, and of course, actually, we need to take and well, it would be a kind of you know well the task of the of the council, trade and investment council, actually, well, to take well areas uh, uh, industry by industry to see what could be done here in order actually well to to expand our uh, uh, trade and other uh, and financial and well investment relations. Thank you. I mean, I, I think we could, um, you know, when I start to look at all of these, this particular agreement, I started off by saying at the beginning that there was that, you know, and Oris, you, you mentioned that as well. Um, there's, there's so many, there's so much within this document. Some of it doesn't, you know, doesn't jump out at you, but deserves um, equal amounts of, of focus um, in, in the relationship. And uh, and so economic clearly does as well. Um, and clearly there's room for growth given um, the trading relationship where it is now and sort of what it amounts to. Um, so Elena, if I can too, because I know we're getting closer to the end of our, um, of, of the time allotted to, and if I could send it back to you uh, and uh, just for your, your final thoughts um, and we'd welcome, um, you know, hearing, you know, as you, as you hear from your colleagues, what, what are some of the takeaways that you have? Thank you, Jonathan. Thank you, colleagues. I believe this was a very useful discussion for all of us on both sides of the Atlantic in terms of understanding how the um, new uh, Ukraine-US um, commitments or intentions, but hopefully still commitments, can materialize into concrete deliverables and how we all can contribute to making that happen. Of course, um, Ukraine's ability to fight Russian aggression in the East and to conduct further reforms uh, very much depends on, on uh, the strength of its international partnerships, um, particularly the partnership with the US. However, it is critical that Ukraine uh, itself accelerates uh, the pace of 
of reforms and continues um, moving towards the EU and NATO uh, integration. Uh, so many thanks again to our um, experts. Thanks to the audience for joining us today. And uh, please stay in touch with us between the Transatlantic Task Force meetings. Um, and please follow our speakers on their uh, respective platforms. Thank you very much again and have a nice rest of the week. Lana, thank you so much. And thank you thank to you. to our speakers and and please feel free to you know we will continue to follow up and look forward to you joining us at our next TTFU uh, event and conversation. Thank you so much. Have a thank good rest you, of your Jonathan. Day. I promise to answer your question directly. <laughs> <laughs> I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Well, and well, questions and answers uh, uh, columns. I'm going to well, well to, to to answer your question directly. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. I saw it. Yeah. Thank you. Take care. Thank Bye. You, Bye, everybody. Thanks, bye. bye. Thanks, bye. Bye, bye.